Thank you very much for that, Shell. So yeah, yeah. So this talk, right? I'm going to take my headphones off because I don't really need to hear you. Um, we'll be doing Q and A afterwards in Slack. Um, so the vision for this talk, it's an interesting one because it actually came from before um, everything went rather strange this year. Uh, so my um, my background um, uh, is, uh, I guess I come from the code upwards, um, but my interest here is trying to frame everything in a slightly different point of view um, because we are... There's a lot of language that goes around about how we develop things um, and development culture. It gets mashed up with startup culture. Um, there's a lot of business terminology that kind of creeps around. But with every piece of terminology, there's a lot of myths and misunderstandings. So I want to disentangle these and see if we can find something a little bit deeper. So what is this talk about? Well, one, it's about 45 minutes. Two, it's about life. Um, and that's quite a big claim. So we're going to explore that one a little bit. Um, so, yes, it is about life, um, and there are some rather uh, interesting aspects that we can learn from um, the uh, evolution of life, but also how we live uh, day to day that directly affect us when we start thinking of our code and our products. So I'm going to give you the ending right at the beginning, and we will return to the, uh, uh, the ending at the end. Um, so what are we going to conclude? Travel light travel well. Keep your options open, pay attention, and be prepared to let go. That's the five things I'm going to offer you right now. So if you are, if, if, if that's, you know, if that's good enough for you, your talk here is done and it's time for a beer. Um, but if you'd like to scratch the surface of this a little bit further, that's what we're going to discuss. Uh, Obviously, I don't always sit at home um, in my home office. Um, there was actually a time that I would travel, and uh, this is what I look like when I'm on a stage. Um, so um, uh, surprisingly similar, uh, but normally more fully clothed than, uh, than I might have been at home. Um, my interests, as I've said, they, they, they kind of go from the big to the little. Um, uh, it's kind of the big picture software architecture. Um, but I'm also interested in the detail of code. So this is a book that I... Um, edited 10 years ago. So a lot of ideas that it have endured surprisingly well. Uh, a more recent uh, book, it's kind of like the lockdown baby. Um, uh, I finished editing this one with Trisha G earlier this year, uh, 97 Things Every Java Programmer Should Know. Um, and there's a really interesting uh, aspect to this. In fact, uh, one of the pieces um, uh, is from uh, 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 Jessica Kerr, um, and she talks very much about product development. You heard Jessica um uh, before uh, talking uh, uh, about various aspects, kind of like the bigger picture beyond the code. And that's where I want to come into. This idea of um, continuousness and improvement. Indeed, there is a Japanese word that normally gets repurposed into this context when we're talking uh, from a kind of a lean perspective, the language of Kaizen. So lean basically introduced uh, a lot of the uh, English-speaking world to a bunch of Japanese vocabulary taken primarily from uh, Toyota. And uh, Kaizen is this idea of how do we improve? Um, we do so continuously. Um, so uh, the kanji is there and it is interpreted as change for the better. That's its general meaning. It doesn't actually mean continuous improvement. Its general meaning is change for the better. But in a business context, it has been taken to mean continuously. So it simply means improvement, but we have added the continuous aspect. So this idea that it comes from lean, lean historically was framed in terms of um, uh, elimination of waste. And if you look at a lot of the stuff from the 80s before it was actually called lean, and I'm talking broadly, not I'm not talking lean software development, I'm talking lean manufacturing, lean product development. Uh, before it acquired the name um, Lean, it was very much uh, just in time. It was very much elimination of waste. And in fact, the language of eliminating waste was the dominant aspect uh, in the 90s. And that's initially what got carried into software development. If you uh, go back to uh, uh, Mary and Tom Poppendick's writing on this, the earlier stuff is more about elimination of waste. But that's a mechanism. What is it that we're trying to achieve? There's, there's a lot of different ways of looking at your practices, your processes, your business culture. A lot of these are uh, framed negatively, eliminate waste. Actually, you don't want to eliminate waste because we spend most of our time trying to discuss what do we mean by waste and we end up with 
crazy contradictions like, oh, this is necessary waste. Well, in that case, it's not waste. And, you know, that's, that becomes a, an oxymoron. Um, uh, uh, that's probably because we're trying to define the mechanics rather than the objective. Over the last decade, the emphasis has shifted. It's all about flow. In other words, what is our objective, not what is our mechanics? What is our objective? Now, this makes better sense of what we may or may not consider to be waste. It's achieving flow. People talk about flow in the kind of the mental state. Uh, we talk about it from a point of view of creativity, basically when you're in the zone, that whole idea of being in the zone. That's a wonderful state when you are writing code and the, everything, the stars align, you're having a great day. It's just all in the flow. The thoughts happen and they flow out of your fingertips and onto the screen. Wonderful. It doesn't happen that often. I get it with uh, writing. I get it uh, with, you know, with running. And everybody has this kind of idea of flow when it comes to some kind of creativity. But we can also talk about it more broadly. That's a personal perspective. What about uh, the bigger picture? And really, it's about if we've got pictures of fish, let's talk about it in terms of it's a current. It's about the current and going with it. The interesting thing here is that we have a number of different ways that we describe this stuff. So one of them is actually this idea of concurrent. Um, there is something inherent. When we talk about flow, we're often thinking about individual flow. But there's another aspect. If we explore the metaphor, concurrency, being able to do things at the same time, that becomes a really key idea, independent development, but also exploring what we, um, what we actually do. So one of the areas that I think um, I still don't see companies doing enough of um, uh, it's this idea of set-based concurrent engineering. Um, this is in contrast to point-based engineering. Point-based engineering is that bit where you say, we're going to build it like this. We're going to build this product like this. Um, and you basically invest all of your energy and your, uh, your, your mental um, uh, energy goes into this. Uh, your collective energy goes into this. This is where your time goes. We're all designing this in this way. Now, set-based concurrent engineering takes a different approach. It acknowledges one of the simple things is actually we have no idea what we're building because we haven't built it before. We have limited knowledge. And I'm going to come back to knowledge towards the end because this is our bottleneck. This is our great challenge. Um, when it comes to developing software products, I sometimes get the feeling that people focus on uh, software development as if uh, we need to type faster. You know, And I, I, I said... Um, many, many years ago, typing is not the bottleneck in software development. But most innovations that people target, it's as if that is the problem. That is not the problem. Although certainly many systems suffer from too much code, too much dead code, too much technical debt. And that's a point I'm going to come back to later as well. That's certainly the case. We have too much of this stuff. It's, it's not that we don't have enough. It's we have too much and it's too much of the wrong stuff. If you're looking for waste, that's where you're going to find a lot of it. But a lot of this stuff exists because initially we're not sure about what we're trying to build or the way we're trying to build it. It's very difficult to tell a product owner that. It's very difficult to be a product owner and say that. I don't know what I want. What you have is a sketch. You have a, a general direction. You have an idea. You're looking for feedback. And typically there is this idea that if you have only one idea, this is a quote from Emile Auguste Chartier, there is nothing more dangerous than an idea when you have only one idea. So this idea of set-based concurrent engineering rather than point-based, I'm going to go for this point, this one way of doing one thing. What you do is you develop simultaneously two or three alternatives. You prototype things. You validate things. Now, a lot of people say, well, it's lost productivity because we're putting our, we're spreading our energies. It's, like, it's not lost productivity because typing was not the problem. It was exploring the problem space that was the problem. And so therefore, if you put all of your energy into one single way of doing stuff, that is the waste. Uh, that's a waste of human uh, intellectual uh, capacity. So concurrency is one thing that we get with this idea of flow. There's another aspect here is the word continuous. Now, we can see that continuous has been creeping into the software development vocabulary um, more and more. Um, continuous integration is one of the most obvious phrases. This comes from the late 1990s. Um, this is uh, a lot of people are not perhaps aware of the uh, uh, the history of many concepts in uh, agile development, for example, um, a lot of I hear a lot of people referring to certain practices as just agile. Was actually very specifically they came from extreme programming, Ken Beck's extreme programming, and continuous integration when it was um, originally positioned in the late 1990s was seen as quite radical. Um, uh, integration was a ritual; uh, it was a big effort, and sometimes you even gave it to one person to do. And, and, 
And, uh, uh, and that uh, person would use shamanistic knowledge to somehow pull the system all together at the last moment at the end of the waterfall process. We've moved on a bit from that. We're in the continuous deployment phase. But we are careless with how we use some of these practices. Continuous deployment, I get this experience on a daily basis where everything I have on my laptop, on my phones and my devices is updating and moving my cheese. I'm, I'm sitting there going, where's the UI? Why, why are you doing this? And if you talk to the developers and saying continuous deployment, that is not an excuse for continuous disruption. People don't like disruption. Um, it, it, what we find is that on a daily basis, we are being asked to reappraise and re-understand um, our products. Just because you have doesn't continuous deployment does not mean you continuously push without judgment. This is a really important uh, distinction. So the first challenge is to get continu uh, continuity, but the second aspect is judgment. What makes for good continuous deployment? So that you're not disrupting people, that you're not injecting new and exciting security um, uh, 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 sort of attack surface areas into your product. You're not messing things up continuously. That is the real challenge there. But we have moved to this idea of continuous everything. Everything's kind of slowly moved together rather than testing as a thing that is in the far future at the end of a life cycle. Life cycle, the, the very word itself is something that we have not appreciated properly. Life is continuous, okay? There's, uh, uh, all of this stuff happens. So we have moved to this kind of continuous everything. Um, we also see it in our tooling, continuous compilation, except we don't call it continuous compilation, but it is, uh, it is that. We, we distinguish it. I mean, technically, it's concurrent compilation. It, uh, it's a technical term that people talk about is actually incremental compilation. And so there is an idea here. A lot of things that we call continuous are not continuous. Continuous deployment is not continuous at all. Um, uh, there's, uh, it is, it is uh, discrete. It is done in steps. It just happens that those steps are much smaller than they were in the past. So therefore we consider them, relatively speaking, to be continuous. I suspect very strongly that in 20 years time, what we currently consider to be continuous deployment is not considered um, a continuous uh, by future standards. So the idea is that if a deployment happens once every few months or every few years, then sure, releasing on a daily basis or multiple times a day feels continuous, but it isn't continuous. You can actually number it you can distinguish between one release and another. So for us, what we call continuous is to do with the fact that it's discrete and we don't really notice it if we're doing it right. So perhaps we need to think about it like this. It is continuous. So somewhere in my past, I have a degree in physics and therefore things like where we, whether we talk about something as being discrete or continuous really matter. And I can tell you one thing is that all of these things we call continuous definitely aren't, but they feel it. That's the feeling we're trying to get. But we should always remind ourselves it is done in discrete steps. Um, it's just that they are small. Uh, we, this is a practice and a, a philosophy that we see absolutely everywhere. You know, for something like refactoring, um, refactoring is about, uh, Martin Fowler observed, he re um, published a second edition of uh, his classic refactoring book last year. In 1999, it was quite a challenge, and a lot of people still hold the belief or the idea. I, I get this from a number of architects when talking, and they, they have a mental model of refactoring being a big thing. Oh, a refactoring sprint they'll talk about. Now, every now and then, you honestly, it doesn't matter how good your development is, you need to take stock. Um, anybody who tells you that they are doing purely continuous refactoring and never have to devote extra energy or time, and they're keeping the technical debt low, is either missing a trick or you're missing a trick about them. Every now and then you have to have a stop and take stock. We're gonna to come to that bit in a moment, but the bulk of refactoring is in the continuity or rather the very small discrete steps run together. So it feels like it's continuous. So from our human perception, you don't end up with the question, hey, what were you doing this morning? Oh, I was refactoring or I was writing production code without the refactoring. You end up with, I was writing code, and that includes refactoring. You can't specifically nominate a minute when you were doing one thing versus another. And we do this for a number of reasons. We do this for a very, very simple reason that it is stable. Um, it is stable 
and it allows us to retain local knowledge. We are working in the flow, but one of the things that allows us to work from uh, flow and without discontinuity is the fact we have immediate recall. That thing I just did, it's not working. There's no mystery as to why it's not working or what is not working. It's the thing you just did because a moment ago it was working. So whatever it is you just did, you can roll back, you can reconsider, you can reappraise. There's no huge contextual overhead that you have to switch in. So this is a good elimination of waste, this idea of continuousness, um, preserving the current context, quite literally going with the flow. But we see it on a bigger picture. We see it not just in the minutes and the personal aspect. We see it in the larger scale. How do we develop products? And when we start talking about development of products and we start talking about the life cycle at the larger uh, level, there is a temptation that people will say, well, we have these milestones and we're going to have these various releases and yeah, yeah, we're doing agile and actually really they're not. They're just doing something that is vaguely incremental, but working towards very fixed milestones. There's no set based appreciation rather than asking the question, what is the best of these options? We're going to go with, they're saying we're going to go with this option and, and, and to hell with it. Um, we're going to put all our effort into that rather than continuously evaluating. That's where our continuousness uh, should be. So, this idea of big bang creation is a real problem. And even in companies that are trying to adopt agile, a lot of companies have just given up trying to adopt agile and they've decided to go for the large scale frameworks, you know, um, less and safe, which in practice really, it's a, it's a public admission of we, have, we, we can't do it. We just can't do what's necessary to do agile development, but we're gonna use the branding. Um, rather than asking the hard questions. How do we get continuous flow and get people in the flow? We want flow of product, but we also want people in that flow. It's a hard thing. And a lot of people just back off from it because it is hard. And they, they find refuge in you know, water scrum, scrum of four, all these variations, safe, less, and all these others. Um, but when we look, let's look at life. Let's look at all these other things. What we find is if you're going to build something that is big, something that is complex. You don't do it all at once. You don't do it by master plan. What you do is you do it by pursuing simplicity in its deepest form. And you flow with that. One of the, one of the issues that we have is that we are not very good at pursue, making an explicit point of pursuing the small and the simple. I often encounter people saying, well, yes, but all these practices you're talking about, I talk a lot about test-driven development. I focus on things like code reviewing, pair practices, and mob practices refinement of code in the detail, the real understanding of how you can take a thousand lines of code and replace it with just a handful if you know what you're doing. All of this stuff is not trivial. It matters because if you don't do it that way, you will end up with millions of lines of code where actually you should have a few hundred thousand or less that we are getting in our own way because we're not realizing that if you want to build a complex system, you need to not big bang it. You don't need these uh, 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 huge milestones. My, milestones are checking points. They, uh, we have got fallen into the trap of thinking that they are the goal and the end goal. Herbert Simon um, introduced this lovely term, um, stable intermediate forms. I first came across it in Grady Booch's writing about 30 years ago uh, when he was talking about iterative and incremental processes. But there's this idea, complex systems will evolve from simple systems much more rapidly, rapidly if there are stable intermediate forms than if there are not. So to understand stable intermediate forms, I can give you a very simple example. Um, uh, walking. When you're walking, you are inherently stable. Um, you are, um, uh, at any point in time, you have one foot uh, uh, on the ground. There is a point of contact. And so therefore, points of contact goes one, two, one, two when you're walking. That is the definition of walking. And indeed, if you ever watch the sport of walking, which looks quite weird, um, you know, Olympic walking, uh, you will see that there are um, uh, attendants by the side of, uh, of the track or the course checking that the walkers are not at any point running. In other words, they don't go through zero points of contact. Running is characterized by zero point of contact, one point of contact, zero point of contact, one point of contact. Okay, so a lot of running is about the fact that you're not actually in contact with the ground. Walking is you are always in contact with the ground. Walking is slower than running. Businesses think that they should be running. Businesses are wrong. They should be walking because walking is inherently stable. Um, the number of walking injuries that I've ever had um, by, uh, through falling is surprisingly minimal. Uh, the number of running injuries I've had by falling is, is a lot higher. Um, in fact, I'm still nursing one from um, June. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be running again until 
October, maybe, who knows, maybe November. Um, the point there is you are unstable. You are, un you are running in an unstable, running is an unstable configuration. And therefore it is prone to risk. And all you need to do is just knock it slightly, get one thing wrong, the whole thing falls apart. Okay. Um, and that's a key point. When we are trying to build complexity, we need to go through an intermediate form, one foot to the other, and both of those points are stable. Whereas running goes through an unstable form. You're out, you're off the ground. That is an unstable. You are, that is unstable. You're going to land. What happens at the landing? Walking, surprisingly stable all the way through. The intermediate forms all make sense. Now, this is characterized by evolution. We see this. We, the word evolution, um, depending on the context of conversation, evolution simply means um, how something changes over time. Or you are talking very specific, uh, specifically about evolution through natural selection which is a definitely a very gradual uh, approach. We appreciate it as going through stable intermediate forms. Um, as life evolves, it does not go through weird intermediate forms. Um, each, each form must be viable at every single point. There's a continuity here. Everything between here and here, when we look at the beginning of the fossil record to the present, everything that goes from here to here makes sense. It is stable. The intermediate forms are coherent and whole. But gradual evolution is only one side of it. This is the interesting thing, is that wherever there is gradualism, even if it is dominant, the new theory came out in the 70s, if I got my timeline right, punctuated evolution. The idea that it's not always continuous, that sometimes there is a hugely rapid change. In fact, they phrased it rather than using, although the term punctuated evolution is used in this context, it was originally framed in terms of punctuated equilibria. You go through periods of equilibria and then there's a change, a sudden change. And it turns out that although we may value continuous improvement and continuous everything, every now and then into that, you need to do something that is a bit more radical. Every now and then you do need to actually take stock of your architecture and go, you know what? Continuous refactoring is not, continuous gradual refactoring is not going to get us there. It's not that you want to be doing that as your main uh, approach to refactoring. <laughs> we leave it 11 months and then we <laughs> try and refactor in the last month of the year. That's not it at all. It is the idea that you will always be doing this continuously. And then every now and then there comes a moment, a moment of realization, a moment of appraisal where you know what? This, uh, our thinking has gone as far as it can with this code in this form. We need to do something different. In that sense, we're always pushing into re-engineering. Hey, guess what? There's a Japanese word for this one as well. Kaikaku, which, you know, I'm sorry if you speak Japanese, I'm sorry for butchering the language, um, but at least I hope I've got the fontage right. And quite simply, this means radical change. Um, every now and then, radical change is what you need. Um, so there is this idea that continuousness is only part of the story. It may be a dominant part. It may be something that we want to focus on. But this idea is that every now and then, the only way to address things is through a radical change. Change your technology change your architecture, change the market that you are going after, change your practices. Every now and then you need that. A lot can be done continuously, but every now and then you need to accommodate the fact that a few percent of those changes or a few percent of the time you're going to spend on change will be sudden. Now, when I'm talking radical change, at this point, somebody says, hey, disruption. Now, disruption is one of those business words that everybody kind of latched onto in the last few years. And I honestly, I'm sick of it because um, you want disruption? Yeah, okay, I'll give you disruption. Um, it turns out that disruption is really not actually the uh, uh, the godsend that everybody thought it was. Um, it's just a fancy term that um, people talk about in terms of startups. Um, uh, they try to make the, you know, how do, how do we make ordering a taxi using your mobile device sound sexy? Well, let's call it disruptive. In many senses, it's not really disruptive at all. It's inevitable. Um, it's simply that many people in the business sector have not read enough science fiction. Uh, most of the ideas that um, are being promoted as uh, disruptive were inevitable and actually from the outside look relatively gradual. Uh, but disruptive sounds more provocative. Um, but it's part of actually, and uh, it's actually the reason we're using this word is it comes from a slightly more considered perspective. Um, Clayton Christensen in the late 90s coined this idea of disruptive innovation. And 
he had a very specific idea here. Um, simply, he was not talking general disruption. He had a very structured idea because general disruption is not what we want. When somebody says they're disruptive, I just think of the kids in my class at school who were disruptive. I don't think that's a good thing. I think of the pandemic. Again, I don't think that's a good thing. We're using, uh, we're using a word in a slightly poisoned sense here. Clayton Christensen had a very specific idea, and it was about this kind of renovation of um, a, a, a market uh, sector from the ground up, uh, taking a vertical slice. And importantly, it was partnered with sustaining innovation. The idea is that disruption, just as we've said, continuity and discontinuity, um, continuous improvement, radical change, these are partnered with one another. One without the other kind of doesn't make enough sense. There's a balance here. Again, this is punctuated equal, equilibria. Within one, you find the seeds of the other, the next movement. There is a period of equilibrium, and you should always be asking how, one, how do we preserve this equilibria? How do we get better at doing the thing that we're doing continuously from this point of view? And two, when's the next change going to come? The big one, okay? That is this idea. There's a kind of duality here, but duality is this idea that we find. Within one movement, you find the movements of the next. Your heart is doing it all the time. Um, uh, systole, the contraction of the heart, um, uh, uh, drawing in the blood, uh, well, pushing out the blood, and diastole um, is, uh, as it were, the relaxation and uh, a movement. So we are constantly doing this. There is a cycle here. So when we look at this idea of uh, this, we are looking at a larger scale equilibrium. You're looking at the bigger picture here. Companies get complacent and stay in one place. Sometimes they get complacent and stay in one place with their product and change nothing. The practices that weren't working last year, well, we were kind of getting away with them, so we'll continue using the practices that don't work. The technical debt didn't totally kill us last year, so we'll keep it this year. The practices and styles and our, even our recruitment policy, well, it hasn't completely broken us, so we're, there's no continuous improvement there. When the change comes, it will be a true shock. Rather than saying we have continuous improvement, we are always looking to change this and we are looking for the next big change as well. And then when that comes, it's kind of like, okay, it was a big change and it's never going to be entirely comfortable. The question is not whether it is comfortable, but whether it is possible or the degree to which it is possible. So linguistically, let's get over disruption. See it as a constant. Business as usual in the high tech fast lane. Uh, we need to get a firm grip. Um, the complacency model doesn't really work, although a lot of our economics are based on it. We also need to be suspicious of um, uh, certain business myths. Um, uh, the, the world is filled with business myths. Um, in fact, that I believe that's what MBAs are all about, is propagating business myths. And a lot of business culture is about taking the myths and making sure that everybody believes the same thing. Kind of a, Here's a classic one, the old idea that, hey, big firms, um, they're more stable and so on. Turns out, actually, they die off at the same rate as the little firms. It's just perhaps where they're more dramatic when they go because they are big. It's as simple as that. Um, uh, we notice them more. There's a bigger impact because they are heavier. But the rate, if we actually look closely, that is stable across the size. What has changed is the rate with respect to our era. So a um, simple example, average lifespan of S&P 500 companies um, was about six decades back in the 1950s. So you go back seven decades and you're looking at a six decade company typically. That's so that's, you know, that's somebody's complete working career and potentially the, the uh, part of the career of their offspring. You could, you could do that, but that's changed. Um, so as of, uh, as of recently, and perhaps 2020 is going to give us some different numbers. Um, they're not going to be better. Um, the average lifespan of S and P 500 companies is about 60 years in the fifties, but in 2019, that average lifespan is down to 10 years. Okay. That is a radical, that is radical. So there is this idea that the, uh, the model of thinking of people who have grown up being mentored by people from the previous generation needs to change. This still applies in software. We like to think of ourselves as young and radical, but actually yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's surprisingly um, uh, conservative in many respects. We're really bad at seeing the change when it happens. We're bad at seeing the change around us. There's the myth of the boiling frog um, that uh, you don't notice, a frog does not notice when they're being boiled. This is a myth. Biologically, that would be a terrible thing. Uh, frogs do notice this and they do jump out of the pan. But there is this idea of appreciating the gradualism and then suddenly it's upon us. Um, Hemingway had it really nicely and the sun also rises. How did you go bankrupt, Bill asked. Two ways, Mike said. 
gradually and then suddenly. All of the signs are always there. And then one day somebody wakes up and says, how did this happen? All of the signs were there, but perhaps we weren't seeing them because we weren't prepared to see them. And this, we see this in development. We see this in rising technical debt within a product. We see this in terms of our customer behavior. It's right across the board. We see what perhaps what we choose to see. And then when we hit the point of inflection and it rises, were we prepared for it? Uh, we are surprised. So um, this is a, a general observation, although it was also made um, uh, 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 in, in context here, uh, Rudiger Dornbusch on um, uh, this idea of uh, talking about the Mexican economy a number of years ago. The crisis takes a, a much longer time coming than you think, and then it happens much faster than you would have thought. Um, you can kind of draw that curve. Everybody, everybody, but you know what? This year, everybody's seen what an exponential curve looks like. Um, uh, I, I, previously, the term exponential, that's one of those terms we need to ret retire unless you actually know what e to the x means. You kind of need to retire. For many people, exponential just meant a linear rise, which is actually not exponential. One of those other terms. I also see from the chat that um, uh, we should kill transformation as well. Yeah, I kind of like the idea of transformation as something that we should uh, um, uh, be very careful about it. It's a, it's a very useful word and it has really devalued. Uh, by the way, um, there's a question here about what's the typeface? Um, which slide? I have, I, I like typefaces. So yeah, clarify that one for me and I'll, I'll come back because uh, I'll, I'll let you know because I do, I do enjoy a good typeface. Um, so here's the key thing. Um, science fiction author William Gibson made the key observation, the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. Everything that is going to happen was already there. Um, we can see this with the pandemic and um, uh, uh, that we're seeing. We can see this with various business crises. All of the signs, everything we needed to know was available. All of the information. We might not have known the timing, but absolutely everything. Uh, the ability and how the world was going to respond, all of that information was already available. The same with your markets, the same with your code, at whatever level. It's just we are not sometimes very good at putting the pieces together until after the fact. That's called retrospective coherence. So there is this idea of whatever, you know, what, what does 2030 look like? Look around you. It's 2020. You will see the seeds of everything that will happen in 2030, whether it is geopolitically or whether it is in terms of programming uh, or products. Everything you need to know is around you. You just have to sift through. But unfortunately, this is not the way that um, we have been trained to think about the businesses. Um, uh, the, my, one of my favorite uh, uh, little cartoons, when we talk about, people keep talking about value. We, we should be value. The goal of a business is to create business value. This is kind of a, again, that's nonsense. It doesn't really mean anything um, because what does business value mean? Is that the, 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 is that the listed worth of the company? Is value a short-term or a long-term thing? because actually will give you different answers and different business cultures. Is value the same as customer value? Is that business value? Well, probably not. What about the value to the people that work for you? What do they value? Is it the same? In other words, to say business value is kind of like the, one of those nebulous terms. When people say we are prioritizing according to business value, they're, they're really not saying anything useful. Um, you, we need to push and be more precise because we're doing precise things. Um, we're creating stuff. So, we should explore this and find out the answer to that question. And we end up with it being devalued. Yes, value gets devalued. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. Beautiful short-termism focused on one single metric um, for one particular demographic. And this is people playing business as a finite game. A finite game is one that is bounded. It is bounded in time. It is objective oriented. A game of chess um, uh, is a finite game. It's not always bounded. It has a finite time, but it's not necessarily limited to it. Okay. In other words, we don't say 60 minutes and you're done 10 minutes unless you're playing speed chess. You're not bounding in that sense, but it has a boundary condition at which we can say it is one. Uh, football, whichever flavor you happen to be into, that is bounded in time. But there is this idea we have an objective. Um, and we have other boxes and constraints. And then when we've done that, we have won or lost or whatever. Uh, we, uh, so people playing business as a finite game are playing the wrong game because the goal of business is not to achieve a release. The goal is not to have created a product. The goal of the game is to keep playing the game. So these are all competitive games. The goal of games where you are trying to actually keep on playing the game, these are infinite games. They are unbounded. Sometimes we do find a boundary if something goes out of business. But the goal of product development, as opposed to project, uh, project management, project management is a finite thing, it is to achieve a specific outcome. 
Product management is completely different, or rather should be, except that I don't see that. I see product owners who have no awareness of the development processes they are tangling with, and they are simply customer relationship managers. They are not actually, they don't actually own the product. They don't actually focus on its qualities. And they're not asking the question, how do we keep playing this game? At best, they're asking, how do we win the next short goal? And those are very different ideas. But the infinite game is where we take ourselves back to evolution. Now, we're talking evolution. Let's talk life. Um, so this stuff, uh, this is code of a particular kind. This is how you create a human. And given that this is the internet, here's how you create a cat, or a fragment of how you create a cat. Um, when we talk about evolution, there is the idea we are normally talking about something that is unplanned in contrast to something that is planned. This is your transformational uh, idea. In many cases, we are actually talking about things that are unintended or situations that are forced on us. What we discover in these cases is that what we're actually talking about is evolution is a response. It is how do we respond to the nature of the change and the context that we're in. So let's talk about response. Yeah, let's go back in time. Let's go back 20 years. And you're thinking, well, hang on. <laughs> We're just gonna just gonna retread the the agile the agile manifesto. It's like yeah, actually I am because there's a bunch of people around going around now saying yeah yeah we tried agile it didn't work. Did they? I mean, really? I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people failing at something that they are calling agile, but it's not very agile. Agile is is not a methodology. It is a mindset, and we'll st we will still be pursuing agile in 20 years. We might call it something different. Sometimes the names change to protect the innocent. Um, and these days we find that many people are saying, oh, Agile's dead, but DevOps is where it's at. Where do you think DevOps came from? DevOps is an, is an Agile technical practice, but now we also see people messing that up. You Apparently you have separation of Dev and Ops in many DevOps environments. It's just a fancy name for Ops. It's all part of the same bigger picture. It's about trying to encourage the continuity so we have this increased awareness, paying attention to what we're doing. But the key idea here, number of key ideas, but the key one I want to draw your attention to is this one. And the number of companies that are doing Agile that are anywhere close to this is absolutely minimal. So what, we've, what we see is that there's actually a very simple definition. So I'm not here to sell you a methodology. I'm here to sell you an idea. I encourage you to actually pursue the idea. My dictionary, or one of my dictionaries, I quite like words. Um, I have a couple. Um, it tells me that agility is about being able to move quickly and easily. Honestly, that's all you need to know. That is what you need to know. Um, that you, you can certify yourself in something if you like, if that makes you feel good. But are your tools helping you do that? Is your mindset helping you do that? Is your product able to be moved quickly and easily? Or is it so riddled with technical debt, the, the idea of moving it is just like, oh, we, we're not considering that. Do we think in these terms? Because unfortunately, what's happened is as things have been sold, and in fact, indeed, as people do agile, it's, it's an adjective, it's a property of something, it's an observation you make of something, it's not a noun, it's not a thing. They've oversimplified it. Even, even these six words were too complex. We've reduced it to four just to move quickly. And we see this in the naive, just as I mock kind of the business idea of like, yeah, let's shareholder value is the value we're trying to pursue. It's, we've reduced everything to one metric. A lot of teams they reduce themselves to one metric. They talk about velocity. Yeah, you know, you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Let's talk about velocity. So here we see a simple um, vector diagram and I've got a vector there, bold V. I've got little v, speed, that's a magnitude. Traveling on 100 kilometers per hour, traveling on 50 kilometers per hour. 100 kilometers per hour, you're traveling twice as fast as if you're traveling 50. That's really easy to compare and understand and measure. But it doesn't tell you anything about your direction. What's your progress? We're traveling at 100 kilometers per hour or 100 story points per sprint, or that's fantastic. Or is it? We're traveling 100 kilometers per hour north. You do know you're supposed to be going south. Honestly, you'd be better off if you were walking. Heading in the wrong direction at great speed is not a virtue. It's not the thing you want to optimize. Velocity is a 
quantity, it's a vector quantity, it has speed and direction. There are a lot of companies that, and a lot of projects and teams that are optimizing their velocity. No, they're not, they're just increasing their speed. They are heading off in the wrong direction. What do we mean by direction in this case? Okay, the, uh, you know, it's, it's a metaphor, but direction in this particular case, how we think about it, we can capture that. Direction is, um, are we doing the right thing in the right way? Um, are we heading in the right direction technically? Are we building up technical debt? Well, no, that's that's really not the right direction. We're not doing that. Are we building the thing that people actually need? Are we getting the feedback that we need? Does this fit with the vision of the organization? What a displacement of our position in terms of time is what we're really after, but are we moving in the right way? Our ability to respond is acceleration. People are optimizing a very flat version of this, in other words, the magnitude, whereas actually agility is about your ability to respond to change, the ability to change direction rapidly. That is acceleration. It's a second order derivative. People are not doing that. Okay, that's the bit we're missing. That is what we mean when we say that. It also means that we need to look at other stuff. Okay, I'm working the physics metaphor a bit here, but the amount of force you need to get acceleration the more mass you have, the less acceleration you get for the same force. If you think of it in terms of workforce and effort, and you think of M in terms of the mass of stuff, the technical debt, the complexity that people are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, then you're not going to get a lot of change for all of your effort. A lot of companies are putting a lot of effort in. Teams find themselves overworked, and yet the effect of their change is minimal. So that's the bit we need to focus on as well. If you want to do rapid change, you want to change direction significantly. You want to, as it were, embrace the discontinuity, or rather, as we've discovered, it's not a hard, discontinuous and discrete thing in this case. It is actually a rapidly evolving, it's an exponent. If you want to embrace that more steep part of the curve, when you change, whether it's to do with markets, the world, or just your coding practices, you need to have less M. You will get more effect for your effort. So we need to talk more about decremental development. Uh, we need less stuff. Less stuff is what's going to help us. If you have less stuff, you're going to have less technical debt. You're going to have less to optimize. If you, you will also find that you have less to make secure. Um, the, the larger your code base, the less well understood your code base is, the less well tested, the, the le more dead code and so on. All of these other factors, the harder it will be to optimize, to change, to enhance, to fix, um, to deal with security issues and so on. And also staff retention, that turns out to be a bit of an issue. So all of this stuff leads us to a, in a particular direction. As Kent Beck observed, the moment design becomes important is when you want to change something. That's when we value it. If you're just heading on a straight line and you don't really realize the need to change that straight line, you won't notice these effects. But the moment you try and turn that corner, and it's a sharp corner, you're suddenly going to notice all of this extra stuff. You'll be unprepared for it. You need to see the corner, but you also need to deal with the load that you're carrying. So sometimes we end up with the over-design because people say, well, we want to deal with the future. They try to over-parameterize everything and we end up with an incredible complexity and we're unable to reach the future. So this is all about knowledge. It is about how we encode or frame our own knowledge about what it is that we're doing. And this idea, as Grace Hopper uh, observed, to me, programming is more than an important practical art. It is also a gigantic undertaking the foundations of knowledge. What you're doing with a product, what you're doing with the work that's in front of you is you're trying to codify knowledge. You're trying to codify what is it we are trying to build and how are we going to build it with what tooling based on our current understanding. It's a collective knowledge exercise. Codification quite literally in code and the assets of a project. That's what we need to be worried about. Well, the assets of a product. You see, the project language is so embedded in us that it's easy to trip up by habit. So, um, we can categorize our kinds of knowledge. There are the known knowns, the known unknowns, the things we know we don't know about. There's the unknown unknowns, things we don't know we know, don't know about, and the unknowable unknowns, the things that we simply do not have a process for finding out about. Uh, and this was uh, conveniently um, put into a structure by Philip Armour about 20 years ago, the five orders of ignorance. Um, and he had a really good way of looking at this, um, uh, zero through four. Four is simply, you don't know about the five orders of ignorance, so we dispense with that. But the idea is that many people operate, they think they estimate and anticipate based on zero and one. And even then we're not very good at one, appreciating the things that we don't know. 
what we need to be aware of is the things that are going to surprise us, our assumptions, um, the things that we simply cannot be, we are not in a position to know at the time, the unknown unknowns, and then they're the unknowable unknowns. I'm going to go back to that idea. When people say we're prioritizing by business value, you can't prioritize by business value. It's a physical impossibility. You are violating the laws of physics because you do not know what the business value of a feature is. You might know what the estimated business value is, but that's not the same. It's an estimate, and an estimate has error bars. It has a range. It has a distribution. If you say you're estimating by business value, it means you know something about the future that nobody else does. And uh, if you do actually know that, then honestly, I don't know why you're watching this talk. You should be a very rich person indeed, sitting on a very nice yacht somewhere. Um, we do not know the future until we experience it. In other words, these are unknowable until they arrive. You do not know the market value of a product or a feature until it has been built and deployed and you are looking back in time. The best you will ever do is prioritize by estimated business um, uh, value, okay? You cannot prioritize by business value unless you break the laws of physics. So we're dealing with the fact that we will always have incomplete knowledge. That is a fundamental aspect of what it is that we are doing. So given all of that, what we're looking at here is this idea that how do we deal with the fact that we do not know everything and cannot know everything, that not everything is knowable at the time we would like to know it? How do we deal with the fact that we struggle with we uh, we struggle uh, often on a day-to-day -day basis to deal with the situation that we're in, even when it's relatively stable? Now we're asking for something that's almost impossible and contradictory. Yes, continuous improvement and watch out for the discontinuities because you need to embrace those as well. We like our simple answers. As I said with Agile, the ability to move quickly and easily, that and really throws people. They, they, they forget the and easily and just moved quickly. So what we're looking for here is that we want to be able to deal with improvement in the broadest sense. You need to understand the continuous improvement and the discontinuous. And you say, well, which one is it? I want one answer. I'm sorry, there isn't one. There's a cat in a box somewhere that might be able to help you. So basically what we have seen is we can't predict the future, but travel light, travel well. Don't, don't take extra baggage with you. Don't, don't take the noise. Be very aware of what you're doing uh, in this sense. Keep your options open. Don't close things down just because it gives you one answer when actually three is what you should be thinking at this point. Pay attention. That's your awareness. Look for those possibilities. You won't always be right, but if you don't pay attention, you're more likely to be wrong. And importantly, whatever investment you've made, just because you spent a long time making a mistake doesn't mean that you should uh, keep it, okay? Be prepared to let go. So, thank you very much.